The Ponkasuchta Aqueduct. The translation from Welsh to English, the bridge that connects. In this episode, we'll be delving into the facts and history of the Pontcasilchte and Churg aqueducts. We'll be looking at them from every conceivable angle. And have you ever wondered what it's like crossing the Pontcasilchte in a canoe? This marvel of engineering was started in 1795 and designed by William Jessup and Thomas Telford. At the time, Britain was at war with France. French banknotes were being printed in Northumberland to flood the French economy. Yet, despite this, money was found to build a huge infrastructure project like this. It took 500 men 10 years to complete this project. The completion date? 1805, the year Admiral Nelson died at the Battle of Trafalgar. It opened to a procession of boats, gunfire and music. 8,000 people were there to witness it. I can only imagine what those first boaters must have felt like going over the aqueduct. They must have been terrified. The cost? £47,018. The aqueduct is 1,007 feet long. That's 307 metres. At its highest point, it's 126 feet high, and that's 38 metres, making it the highest navigable aqueduct in the world. The trough is 11 foot 10 inches wide, 3.6 metres, and 5.3 foot deep, that's 1.6 metres. The canal water runs underneath the towpath to allow for the movement of the water around the boat and also to prevent the water displacement created by the boat from spilling over the edge of the trough. I don't know whether it's possible to tell from this angle, but the approach to the aqueduct from von Kitzelte was actually built on a massive embankment. The embankment was built from the spoil that was taken from Chirk Tunnel. The dripping you can hear is a bit of a leak. When the aqueduct was first built, it was filled with water for six months to ensure that there weren't any leaks. I'm sure over the years there have been a few here and there. In 1985, a cold winter, a landslide and a flood in the River Dee caused some of the seals in the trough to weaken and split. This actually caused quite a major leak. In the last episode, I scoffed at the use of oxblood being mixed into the mortar. Now apparently, oxblood was used as an air and training agent to improve the frost resistance of mortar and has been used since Roman times. The blood from 1,700 oxen was used in this construction. Thanks to Stephen Given for enlightening me. In 2005, 200 years after the aqueduct opened, it was given a major overhaul. Every nut, bolt and washer in the structure was examined. Of the cast iron supports that hold the towpath above the trough, only five were replaced.
Once again, many thanks to Nick Livesey for the fantastic drone footage. Links are in the description box below. Originally, there were to be three locks either side of the aqueduct, making it substantially lower. There were concerns that the structure wouldn't be able to support the massive weight involved. The water alone weighs 1,500 tonnes. The piers were designed to be tapered to reduce this weight and they were also hollowed out after a height of 70 foot and so the structure rose to the impressive 126 feet it is today. Sandstone for the piers was quarried at local sites in Frankesilchte and also Kevinmauer just up the road. Local iron ore was taken to the newly built state-of-the-art foundry at Plasklinasten. This was used to make the elegant trough supports and the trough itself. These arched iron trough supports were totally innovative at the time. The trough was made watertight by packing Welsh flannel, which is mainly wool, soaked in lead and boiled in sugar and iron and then placing it in between the joints. Now you may remember from my last vlog I mentioned the plug that is in the aqueduct that is pulled every sort of seven or eight years for maintenance to be carried out. There is an exceptionally good video of this occurring from more or less this very spot and you can see all the water, all 1,500,000 litres of it, tipping into the River Dee below. I'll put the link in the description box below. Now I've heard various reports as to how long this process actually takes. Some have said two hours, some three, some four hours. But hey, that's a hell of a lot of water to tip out of that aqueduct. The viaduct in Kevin Mauer was opened 43 years after the Pont Kasilchte in 1848. So, now it's one thing going over the Pont Kasilchte aqueduct in an arrowboat, but what on earth's it like going over in a canoe? Well, we're not about to argue with Sydney, that's for sure. Is there anyone behind you? Is there anyone behind you? Yes. Okay. All right, okay. Looks like we'll have to wait for oncoming boats and let any narrow boats waiting on this side to go first. OK, here we go. Rust on there. 
Not only is the aqueduct functional, but it has a Georgian elegance about it. And compare that to the 1960s building over there. Yes, that's functional, elegant. Well, I'll let you make your mind up about that. Chirk Aqueduct was started a year after the Pont Casilchte in 1796. It was completed five years later in 1801. Labourers were redeployed from the Pont Casilchte to speed up the completion. In the original design, only the base of the trough was clad with iron. The sides were sandstone and mortar. This, however, was prone to leaking, and so, in 1869, a three-sided cast-iron trough was added. Photographing me, photographing you, eh? The viaduct carrying the Chester to Shrewsbury railway line was built alongside the aqueduct in 1846 and opened two years later, although it did have to be rebuilt in 1858. It is thought it was built 30 foot higher than the aqueduct to prove it a more superior form of transport. There was open hostility towards Henry Robertson, the viaduct engineer, from the local landowners, who threatened to throw him and his theodolite into the canal. He had to complete the surveys at night. Like the Pont Casilchte, it too was originally planned as a much smaller structure which involved crossing the valley 300 metres to the west on an embankment. But Richard Middleton, the occupant of Chirk Castle, deemed that this would not be aesthetically pleasing and ruin the landscape, and so the Ten Arch Aqueduct was designed and built. Amazing that they added decorative classical niches on either end of the viaduct. Chirk Aqueduct doesn't really get the recognition of its larger counterpart, but personally I feel the position of the adjacent viaduct and tunnel complements the aqueduct and actually adds drama to the scene. <laughs> 